Hi everyone, it's Margaret Manning here and welcome to Mornings with 60 and Me. Today is Wednesday, September 14th. It's a beautiful autumn day here in Switzerland. I don't know what your weather is like where you are, but I hope that you're having a great uh, morning so far. I'm having my cup of tea this morning. I've got my uh, Darjeeling, uh, one of my favorites. Um, hope that you've got a cup of coffee or tea, sitting down comfortably, and I'll bring you through some items uh, in the news, and world news. And also, I'm gonna keep news a little short today because I want to cover a couple of articles um, that you've actually asked for, and I want to make sure that we leave some time for that. But I'll give you a quick update on what's going on in the world. Well, former Israeli President um, Shimon Peres is uh, in intensive care in hospital in Israel. He has had a stroke. Uh, at 93 years old, he is in a delicate condition and uh, his family is by his side. Uh, he is a very um, beloved uh, leader in Israel. He brokered the um, peace settlement and won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he's done a lot for his country and uh, just wish uh, he and his family well. In the United States, um, Hillary Clinton uh, says that she's going to be back on the road in on Thursday uh, campaigning. But while she was recovering from her pneumonia, President Obama stepped in to do some campaigning for her. It's warming up in the United States with regards to the election. Uh, Donald Trump is out talking about his plans for child care and uh, women's rights. And uh, he is um, also um, going to be releasing, he says, his health um, reports uh, to the public. So he's, uh, he's making sure everyone knows he's, uh, he's in uh, good shape. So that's the situation with the election in the United States. I'll let you get the rest from your channels that are covering it absolutely nonstop. Now in Taiwan, speaking of weather, <laughs> Typhoon Maranti is set to uh, a clobber Taiwan. It's um, the mainland of China is also going to be affected. This is a really fierce storm. It's got 225 mile an hour winds and uh, it's heading right for Taiwan. So I have a lot of friends in Microsoft who work in that part of the world and I know people in Taiwan. So hope everybody's safe. It's um. A typhoon season in that part of the world and it's very uh, very violent sometimes so let's just hope that it um, it doesn't uh, you know cause too much damage and that everyone stays safe that's in Taiwan and um, mainland China now I read a report yesterday that I wanted to bring to your attention because it just kind of shocked me and I just wanted to share it with you I mean I, I've known this um, intellectually for some time but this report kind of hit me at a more emotional level there's a report by Oxfam, which is a nonprofit in the United Kingdom, that wrote about um, basically world poverty and inequality. And it turns out that uh, UK is actually one of the lowest performing, is one of the most unequal countries in the world. But the report highlighted the situation around the world. And that is 62 people in this world have more wealth than, the, than half the planet. So they have more wealth than three point some billion people, 62 people. And of those 62 people, 53 are men and just nine are women. And you know the, the, the point of this report was to say that as time goes on, the wealthier are just getting richer. Their, the economy is supporting their, um, their control of the economy and uh, personal wealth. And the poor are getting poorer. Now, this is like no big surprise to any of us. We all know this just from our own experiences. None of us, I don't think, are in the 62 uh, most wealthy people in the country. Never know. There may be someone out there, but um, you know, it, it's most of us are in that other category. And um, so anyway, I think it just, uh, hi Oxfam is highlighting the need for governments to find some ways to balance this, to get people from the general public, from the general workforce into situations where they can be earning more. And well, the interesting um, counter to this though was the, um, I read that the medium income in the United States has actually just risen this year. Now, that sounds great. It's risen to $56,516 in uh, this 2015, but this is the first time it's actually gone up since 2007. So that's good news. But the, the, the poverty rate is, is even declining a little bit, but still 30, sort of 43.1 million people in the United States are below the poverty level. So the numbers sound good, but there's still a lot of people who are dealing with poverty in their lives and the inequality around the world 
um, is causing, in my opinion, a lot of cultural injustice and a lot of challenges uh, that we are seeing in other manifestations in the world. So that's uh, that's a story I think is interesting. Um, another one that I wanted to raise for you today is something that we talk about quite a bit and people have asked about, you know, just how to st establish a good diet in their 60s. I think women in our community are doing a pretty good job. Um, the, the, feed, the feedback I get is we're creatively, um, you know, uh, eating good food, we're, we're finding foods that are um, superfoods and nutritious for us. But it turns out <laughs> that, um, oh, and actually this is what I was talking about social media, is it's a good thing that all this information is coming to light because it turns out that um, back, back in the 60s, the sugar industry really controlled the messaging around what was good for you. And you can read this article, I'll leave you the link because it's quite a detailed um, research project that um, has really revealed some, some very dramatic things. One is that in the 60s, the sugar industry actually paid um, researchers, um, and I don't know whether they were at Harvard, but the research came out from Harvard. Um, they paid researchers to do studies to show that sugar was not really the culprit when it came to obesity and bad health, that it was really the fats. It was it was fat that was the problem. And if you remember, I mean, we've lived through this as older women, the messaging around low fat, eating low fat items as opposed to, you know, to high fat. And we just believed all of that. Now, the reason for this, according to the um, research, is that this five decades of, of, of research was published in very prestigious magazines. So um, it was like the New England um, uh, Journal of Medicine, which, you know, very reputable. So people believed it. And for a long time, the focus went from sugar being not so good for you to fat being the problem. So these, this article reveals the um, manipulation, really, of, of, the, of the sugar industry to, to convince us that we should stop eating fats, but it was okay to eat lots of sugar. Anyway, I think it's already very interesting. And I think what's fascinating about us older women is we've seen it in perspective. So anything now that comes out, it's certainly how I approach it, um, you know, in terms of guidelines for healthy eating, I always do my homework beyond the research, <laughs> you know, and I, and I always uh, look at where the source of the research is coming from. You know, who's sponsoring the research that's telling me not to eat something or to eat something else. Anyway, I'd love your feedback on this. If you've got thoughts about this, I think it's a pretty dramatic um, finding and um, hopefully will guide us to having a better healthy um, focus on aging. Okay, now this um, this is the story that I wanted to spend some time on today, because you've asked me for it, and um, when I you know shout out and say what do you want to, us to talk about, and many women ask the question, I pay attention and I'm going to do my best today to talk about it, because it's a subject that um, is on our minds in our 60s, but not something that perhaps we take action to to deal with, and that is planning for your death. Now, I like to say it's planning for your life, because if you're planning for your death, you're actually clearing the way, you're getting everything out of the way to just live your life, your beautiful life that's left on this planet. And by having that kind of put to one side, you can live more fully. You can live the, the life you want and do those things that are on your bucket list and do them with a, with a clear mind that you've, you've sorted things out. It's funny, when I remember when I was younger and uh, I traveled a lot, I always thought, you know, gosh, what would happen if something happened to me and my kids were quite young and I thought, I, I would just feel so bad if they didn't know how I felt about them and I didn't leave my kind of little, you know, message to them. So I worried about it for a long time and then one day I just wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to them. They were only, you know, maybe 12, uh, 16 at the time, 15 at the time. And I, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to write a letter. And I did from my heart. And after that, I felt so much better knowing that if something should happen, an accident of some kind, they would, they would know how I felt and they would know what I wanted to happen with my things. And, you know, just a few little, just a request just to make it easier in some ways for them. <laughs> and so that's one of the key things, that doing this is not only going to be good for you, it's going to be good for your family too. You know, I talk, we talk a lot about this and there are many sites out there to help you organize your thoughts about it, but we do kind of put it to one side. 
Uh, on 60 and Me, we've actually done a number of really great videos. I say great because the people I interviewed were great. Uh, John Underwood uh, was is the man who started something called Death Cafes. And these are meetings where you get together with other people who want to talk about death and just talk about your 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 feelings, you know, your maybe fears or your 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 questions about how to handle it. And uh, anyway, John is amazing and some of his videos are, are very helpful about planning your funeral, you know, just talking openly in society about death and bereavement. Now, I, I chose a couple of sites that I know about. There's many others, but just one that, um, you know, I think provides some templates and some guidance that might be helpful for you. So there's a site called OK to Die, and their mission is really to help people plan ahead. It's as simple as that, and to make peace um, with their own feelings about death and to help them make lists, you know, to answer questions that are going to be useful. So um, most of the time, you know, our death is probably going to occur, um, well, I say hopefully, but, you know, with, with some warning or some at least uh, time to prepare. But sometimes it doesn't. You know, sometimes it's an accident or something that we didn't expect. So uh, it's good to, uh, you know, OK to Die talks about the things you should, like a checklist that you should go through and just tuck away somewhere, put in a box with a pink ribbon. <laughs> That's what I've done. And, uh, you know, just things that you'd want someone to find and to read uh, when you died. It's good to be prepared. So they say there's obviously there's different um, deaths that you might have to deal with in your life, you know, death of someone that you love, someone, a friend, someone who might ask for you to be, uh, to, to help to um, manage their estate. But they, let's talk primarily about our own personal death. Now, um, first thing is the personal cleanup, you know, the things that you want to say to people that you may have not had time or just had the courage to say, it's those goodbyes. It's the, um, you know, the apologies, perhaps, the, the I forgive yous, you know, the things that you just want to say to people. Uh, so there's a, ch a checklist on this website of the kinds of things that you might want to put in that personal cleanup bucket. Uh, you might want to write a letter to some people and just seal it and let it be given to them later. There's also the insurance issues. This is the second thing. These are the things that, you know, do you have a life insurance policy? make sure there's a copy of it somewhere for someone to review. And if you don't, consider perhaps having at least a minimum uh, death benefit uh, policy where your funeral and expenses are covered. Um, in talking to women in 60 and Me, worrying about how your family will deal with your, your death is a number one concern. The actual process of dying, we live it, we, we go through it. But um, so the second thing they talk about is a checklist of insurance um, uh, issues. Also, um, business arrangements. So if you've got any stocks or things that, um, you know, that might have some financial implication, uh, that's something else to take care of. And there's a checklist on this site to, to go through that. Personal effects is another thing. This is who gets what, you know, and I, I've got uh, so many sort of little treasures that I've hidden away and I'd like certain people to get them. So that's a, an opportunity on this list to go through um, unfinished um, uh, you know, projects you might have, things you want someone to take care of. And in this category are also your pets and your, your furry friends. Uh, you want to make sure that they're taken care of as well. So this is a place to write that down. Funeral planning, that's a big issue. Uh, you know, what do you want at your funeral? You know, do you want to be cremated or buried? Do you want to be a plant? Do you want to grow into a tree, <laughs> like a bio urn, where someone can plant your, your ashes and a tree can grow? Do you want, what kind of service do you want? Music? Do you want a eulogy? Do you even want a funeral? Do you want just to have a party? <laughs> Lots of music. I, I always keep doing this. I, I see a song that I really love and I write it down. Definitely want this one written at my, a, a song at my funeral or played at my funeral because it's a time, it's really for the, your family and friends, but little memories of you that you can give them hints and guesses of what you might like is nice too. So, and the other thing finally, um, well, not so much finally, but the final thing they list is the contact list. You know, who should know about your death? Uh, who, who are people that you'd like to be informed? And there is actually one related theme to that, which I wanted to mention, and that's your social media accounts. 
We've written about this in 60 and Me. You can go back and check the articles. But, um, you know, what do you do with your Facebook page? What do you want done with your Facebook page, with your Twitter account, with your blog? It's really important to write these things down. So okay to die is just one place where you can go and uh, download their, their um, uh, checklists and templates and fill them out. Just a place to get started, then put them in a little box and, and tell someone or tell a few people that that's what's, um, where everything is. And of course, with social media goes your passwords, passwords to everything. That's always useful to let people know. Now, there's another site I wanted to mention real briefly, which I know about, um, called everplans.com. And everplans uh, doesn't, so, well, it does actually talk about planning for your death, um, so sh should something happen to you accidentally, but it also um, gives you lots of templates regarding to like your, a will, uh, trust, um, it talks about um, how to deal with your home and bills that might be related to your home. It's the financial issues around around dying, and that's called everplans.com. And they're actually also uh, they also cover your sort of funeral wishes and your preferences as well. So there's a couple of options there for you. I hope this has been helpful. You know, I don't want you to think about this as being a depressing, um, you know, talk, talk. I want you to see it as a way to be happy in your life and to give yourself freedom to move on. Do take care of these things, just get them out of the way, put them in a box, let someone know, and then move on. And there's a quote that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's by the Buddha, and well, it's attributed to the Buddha, and it's something, it's one that I actually have, you know, I follow as a, as a, a guideline in, in my life, and that is this. In the end, these things matter most. How well did you love? How fully did you live? How deeply did you let go? Those I think are the three questions I'm gonna be asking myself at the end of my life. I will in fact, I ask it every day. Hope you, uh, you thought that was a, a useful perspective on, on, uh, on death as well. And so my question, so basically, I hope that was helpful. <laughs> um, it, was, it was in a way a difficult one to talk about today because it's not something that you know, we, we discuss very often. So I hope it was constructive. And if you've got any thoughts on this, please leave your comments below. This is the time and the place for you to share with others your feelings about death, your feelings about your own dying, and uh, what you're gonna, you know, how you're gonna manage that. So my question for the day is this. Do you think it's a good idea to plan for your death, even though you want to live for many, many more years? Please leave your comments in the section below and let's have a, have a conversation. Do you think it's a good idea to plan for your death, even though you want, to, well, even though you're planning to live a lot longer? Thanks everyone for being here today. I hope you have a really wonderful Wednesday and I really do look forward to seeing you all back here together on Mornings with 60 and Me. Have a fabulous day everyone. Take good care.